Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The word of God that I would lay on your hearts today comes to us from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 5 through 12. We read. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, Let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. So far, God's holy word. Dear friends in Christ, fellow redeemed, how much do you trust the reviews? If you are trying out a new restaurant, or maybe looking for a new salon to get your nails done or your hair cut, are you one of those people who usually has to reach into their pocket, grab their phone, and check the latest Yelp or Google reviews? Or if you're wanting to see a new movie, maybe you check its star rating on some website first, or perhaps you open up your newspaper and see what the local critics have to say about that new film. I don't know about you, but for me, it's pretty encouraging and exciting when I read a nice positive review. It can really go a long way in making you want to go to that movie, for example. If you see a glowing headline like, Young Actor Shines in New Hollywood Blockbuster, maybe that'll be enough to get you to spend your money at the box office. If the Christian life was a movie, and you had to write a review about it, what would you say? What points would you highlight? Would you give away any spoilers? And what would your headline read? In God's word for this morning, the Apostle Paul gives us, in these verses, our text for today, a brief review of the Christian life, a life that he knew well, a life of suffering and hardship, which proclaimed the message of Jesus. And if he were to put a headline on this review, perhaps it would sound something like this. Jesus shines in the Christian life as a light in a darkened heart, as the power in a challenging life, and as the hope in a blessed death. Now, 2 Corinthians is not one of Paul's most well-known letters, but it speaks to the harsh realities of life and about the unbreakable faith that sustains us during difficult and dangerous times. If you remember, in chapter 11, the Apostle Paul catalogs a number of the struggles and trials that he went through in his life. He had been in prison. He had been flogged. He had been stoned and shipwrecked, robbed, starved, and abandoned. The Apostle Paul was more than qualified to speak about hardship. And as if all that wasn't bad enough, some of his critics and opponents in Corinth were kind of kicking him while he was down, saying that, you know, the real reason that Paul is suffering is because he's not a true apostle. If he was truly an apostle, God would glorify him. God would make him wealthy and happy. All these bad things wouldn't be happening to Paul. And that's why our text begins with Paul clearly stating his mission in verse 5. He says, what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. Paul was preaching Jesus Christ as Lord. Those four words actually appear a number of times in Paul's epistles. We think it might have been an early creed or a motto of Paul. Jesus Christ is Lord. Not himself, 
not any of us, not anyone else, but Jesus Christ alone. Jesus, who is the Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah, who demonstrated himself to be Lord of all in his nature and life, and death and resurrection. Paul goes on, For God, who said, Let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts. That's a pretty awesome comparison, isn't it? You know, if you're looking for a good analogy, the best analogies always come from Scripture. Here, Paul uses the analogy of creation to compare a Christian conversion. In Genesis 1, we read those familiar verses, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and empty, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And then God said, Let there be light. And there was light. I've always found it interesting that on that first day in time, God created light before he created the objects that radiate light. The sun and the moon and the stars, they didn't come until day four. So where did it come from? What was the source of light in darkness? It was God's word, wasn't it? He spoke and light appeared. Like the empty darkness that covered the deep, the natural human condition is also empty and dark, isn't it? Popular psychology likes to tell us that deep down within each and every person, we're actually good. If you scrape away enough of the bad stuff on the outside, you'll find a virtuous and tender heart deep down. But the Bible tells us in Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. So like creation in the beginning, our natural state is empty and dark. Our hearts are eclipsed by the original sin of Adam, which taints us, and our own actual sins from everyday life. But like creation, the empty darkness of sin has the same antidote. What is the source of light in the darkness of our hearts? It's God's word, once again, isn't it? God speaks the good news of Christ's sinless life and his guiltless death and his resurrection. And the light of faith appears within us. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing the word of God. Jesus shines in the Christian life by beaming the light of the gospel into the Christian's heart. God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown into our hearts to give the light of the glory of God, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That's kind of an interesting phrase, isn't it? In the face of Jesus Christ. We remember how Moses' face reflected God's glory after he came down from Mount Sinai. He was the mediator of the law. The glory of God is embodied, radiates from the face of Jesus, because he is the glory of God, the mediator of the gospel. He is the light of the world. And that light of the gospel, that light of the world, that light of life is shining in your hearts. And that's quite a treasure that we have inside of us. Imagine if you got a phone call, and on the other end of the line was your lawyer, and he says that, one of your long-lost uncles has passed away, and he's left his entire inheritance to you. Well, after some healthy skepticism, you come to find out that it's all true. In the next few days, you go and collect all your cash. Millions of dollars. Instantly, you're a millionaire. Let me ask you, what do you do with that newfound treasure? Do you take it home and stuff it in some duffel bags and put it under your bed? Or maybe stack it in some boxes and put it in your closet? I hope not. If you're anything like me, you go straight, immediately, and very nervously drive to the bank where you put it in your account, get that deposited quickly. That's what we do with treasure. We lock it away in a safe place, a secure vault or a big chest. That's what we do with treasure. The treasure of the gospel, that light shining in your heart, is much more valuable than any kind of treasure of money we could ever have in this life. And yet, what does God do with that treasure? Verse 7 tells us, We have this treasure in jars of clay 
to show that the surpassing power belongs to God, not to us. We humans, we Christians, are clay jars into which God has placed his most precious treasure, the message of the forgiveness of sins through Jesus. It's an amazing picture. It has a ton of meaning packed into it, doesn't it? What do we know about clay jars? They're very ordinary, for one. You can find them everywhere, especially in Paul's time in the houses of peasants and common people. Wealthy people use more exotic materials like ivory or glass or fine wood. But regular people just use clay pots. It would kind of be like saying, we have this treasure in plastic bags. We got them everywhere. They're disposable. Secondly, clay jars are very fragile, aren't they? Compared to marble or ivory or even wood, clay just didn't last. And since it was so cheap, no one really expected it to last very long. So if one of the, your clay jars got too chipped or cracked to use, or when it fell and shattered, you simply get a new one. They're disposable. So Paul creates this great paradox in our verses today. God has taken this great treasure, the gospel of Jesus Christ crucified, and he's placed it into people like you and me, people that are fragile and common and ordinary. Why would God store something so valuable in a container that is so ordinary? One reason, to be the source of power in the challenging lives of ordinary, fragile vessels like us. That way it's clear that whatever challenges we overcome in this life are only overcome through God's power. For example, Paul himself, the little bit that we know about Paul is that he was not a very impressive person. Paul was not an eloquent speaker. We know that he was pretty small in stature. We think that he probably had some pretty difficult health problems. He might have had poor eyesight. His opponents loved to criticize and slander and reject and persecute Paul. And yet, despite all of this, Paul became the greatest evangelist who ever lived. He started churches all over the Mediterranean world. So how in the world did he do that? The only explanation, of course, is that the gospel power of Jesus shone through him. It doesn't make much sense to put something so valuable in a container so ordinary and fragile, unless, of course, you don't want the container to be noticed. Unless, of course, you want them to notice the treasure inside. Imagine if you're having some guests over for dinner, and you decide to make a special meal, perhaps a famous family pasta recipe. You have one of those sauces that takes all day to cook. You have to stir it and add ingredients one by one. It takes a lot of attention to detail, but you're going to do it because you care about your guests a lot. And so you put in all this effort. And then finally, when it comes time to eat, you bring out your special sauce and you place it in the middle of the table. And everyone exclaims, oh my, what a beautiful serving bowl that is. <laughs> it would be pretty disappointing, wouldn't it? This whole time you work so hard on this sauce, and all they do is to admire the serving bowl the whole time, and the sauce doesn't get any attention at all. Well, the next time you'd serve it up, you'd probably stick it in a disposable foil pan. That way everybody knows about the good sauce. So it is that God pours his life-giving and life-changing gospel message into ordinary containers like Paul, and like you, and like me. So that when people see the challenges that we overcome in life, they don't look at the container. They look at the treasure. They look at the gospel inside of us. We are who we are only because of the treasure that we carry within us. That quickening power of Christ and him crucified. That power of the gospel which does change lives. The harder life gets, the more roughed up, indented that the clay jars become the more obvious the treasure is. Makes sense, doesn't it? It's an important lesson for American Christianity today. You don't have to look very hard to find a preacher or a Bible teacher who wants to tell you that God truly wants you to be healthy and wealthy and happy. 
you listen to Christian radio for a while, or you turn on a Christian cable broadcast, if you surf the internet, you'll find people telling you that God wants you to bless you with success and happiness, prosperity, a long and lovely life. There's nothing new about that teaching. It was happening in Corinth at very when Paul wrote this letter. So what was Paul's spirit-inspired answer? He says, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. We might say he was stressed out. Have you ever slumped through the day as if you had the weight of your, the world on your shoulders? Paul was afflicted, but he didn't give in. He says, we're perplexed, but not driven to despair. In other words, we're confused, we're bewildered, we're mixed up. Have you ever been so overwhelmed by the complexities of your own life or by some difficult decision that you had to make that you're completely paralyzed? You don't know what to do. Paul was perplexed, but he didn't give up. We're persecuted, but not forsaken. Jews and Romans and false teachers and even fellow Christians were criticizing and hounding Paul everywhere he went. Do you ever feel like as though everyone is out to get you, whether it be family or friends, your boss, your school, or the court system. Paul says, we're struck down, but we're not destroyed. Emotionally and literally, Paul's been knocked off his feet again and again. Maybe you know how that feels. Maybe you've experienced some setbacks in your life, financial troubles or health problems or lost jobs, or family strife. Paul and his partners, they were struck down, they were stressed out, they were mixed up, they were picked on, they were knocked down, over and over and over again. What a review of the Christian life, right? Sounds pretty rough, doesn't it? But do you know what? They always got back up again. The devil has done his worst to us. He did all that he could to tempt Jesus to sin. He did all that he could to... Make Jesus' death and resurrection and atonement not count for us. But he failed. The true victory has already been won. The world continues to do all it can to you, to drag you down, to chip you up, and to crack you like a clay pot. To make us doubt God's love for us. But we Christians are still standing. Not because of who we are, because we're just a bunch of clay jars. But because of the life-giving gospel power that God has placed within us, because Jesus shines in the Christian life. In the good times and the bad, Jesus still shines. So if you're feeling afflicted, or perplexed, or picked on, or knocked down, it doesn't necessarily mean you're doing something wrong. In fact, it probably means that you are right where you're supposed to be. God doesn't take pleasure in our hardship, nor does he allow pain simply to see how we react to it. It's just that in this world, every time that we get knocked around, dented or scraped up, we show the world that there is something special inside of us, that the treasure within us has incredible value. It's priceless. That is the life and death of Christ. The thing about clay jars is they're meant to be used, aren't they? Kind of like plastic bags. God's not looking for sterling silver tea sets. He's looking for rough and tumble clay pots, the kind that can be used every day, the kind of pots that don't need to be tucked away in a china cabinet, but can be sent out into the world, carrying within them the death of Christ, the kind of pots that sooner or later will break down. That's a truth for all of us. The kind of pots that will one day fall apart and come to the end of their earthly lives and return to the clay from which they came. Paul says, we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. Jesus shines in the Christian's life, maybe brightest of all, in the Christian's blessed death. When's the last time you've been to the funeral of an unbeliever? Is there a more depressing place in all the world? I don't think so. In contrast, when's the last time you've been to the funeral of a Christian? With Christians, it often happens that the light of Jesus shines most brightly when our earthly clay vessels are finally broken, 
truly return to the earth. Is there a more hopeful and blessed place in all the world than a Christian funeral? Sometimes we don't even call them funerals. We call them victory services. At Christian victory services, we read Bible passages proclaiming the peace, proclaiming the promises of eternal life. We sing hymns ushering the beloved into the heavenly halls with Jesus. We rejoice because the souls of our dearly departed are even now in paradise awaiting the last day when Christ will raise our broken bodies from the ground, when he will glorify them, when he will join our souls back to them one last time to take us to be with him forever in heaven. A Christian funeral is a celebration, not of the Christian's life, but of his blessed death and what Christ has done on his behalf. It's an ending of the fight, a crossing of the finish line. What a way for Jesus to shine in the Christian's life one last time. So what do you think of Paul's review of the Christian life? Not too bad, huh? Jesus shines in the Christian life. We are those jars of clay, and he is the treasure. The treasure that shines as the light in our darkened hearts. The treasure that shines as the power in our challenging lives. And the treasure that shines especially in the hope of our blessed death. In Jesus' name, amen.